hey guys, Jerry wanted me to come talk to you guys while he was out on sabbatical. And of course, I didn't get to do that in person, uh, which I apologize for, but it's the situation we're in. I hope you guys are praying for Jerry uh, through this tough time. I know it can't be easy um, trying to hear the voice of God and, you know, be closer to him and and kind of break away from the normal routine when you're in quarantine. So I hope you guys are praying for him and um, and let's hope for a speedy return. And uh, let's let's hope that he comes back refreshed. You know, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lee Pounds. I'm a deacon here at Bellevue Baptist Church. I'm also a Sunday school teacher. I play bass guitar for the Sunday worship band. And uh, you, I'm married to Katie. You may know her. She teaches children Sunday school. Uh, she also uh, helps clean the church on Thursday. She's a part of the choir. And also, you may know me by my children, Luke and Anna. Uh, if you've ever done anything with Kick or Kids. Uh, children's church or nurse or what have you. Um, that's a weird thing to say. You may know me by my children. Um, but, I mean, if you really think about it, uh, you can kind of get to know somebody's parents through their children. Uh, the stress points they have, the reactions they have to certain situations, decisions they make, kind of can be a reflection of their parents' character and who they are as a person. I know some of you just went through uh, DNOW, which I was a part of, and I, I absolutely had a blast. Um, and the topic was identity, or I am who you say I am. Our identity as Christians, um, in a way, speak to who Christ is, just like we can be reflections of our parents. Uh, we can, we're a physical representation of the kingdom of Christ, and we're a reflection to the world around us of who Christ is. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians twelve twenty seven. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That's a scary thought for me. Um, because how can I be... Um, a reflection of who Christ is in my life, uh, knowing everything I've done, knowing all the sins I've committed and, you know, the sinful nature of being a, a human. How can I be a reflection of Christ? Knowing, Romans 3.23 says, for all of sin fall short of the glory of God. That's a tough, it's a tough, uh, tough thought. Because he's powerful, he's all-knowing, he's omniscient, omnipotent, and... You know, how, how can we even be a reflection of that? Um, but I think the easiest way, for me anyway, to be a reflection of that is telling people about God's forgiveness in my life, the grace that he's extended to us. See, the, God gave us the law to show us how sinful we are and that through the grace of Jesus we're forgiven we have an opportunity in our lives to show God's love and forgiveness to those around us. And it took me entirely too long to understand what real forgiveness really was. I knew that God had forgiven me, but I wasn't sure how I could forgive. And I used to hold a lot of anger and resentment around that. Um, one day, actually at Bellevue, uh, one of our former deacons, Larry Thornton, and um, he's our treasurer still, uh, he came and gave an illustration it's on, on during the service. And uh, some of you may have been a part of that. He told a story about a church member who had a DUI or a drunken driving incident, ended up in the hospital, and was laid up in the hospital with a lot of shame and uh, felt very guilty. And so the deacons um, gave him rocks. And the reflection there is, is you know, how can we throw the stone? Because we're all sinners. And... You know, we can't judge you for the sins you've committed. And that was a pretty powerful story he had there. And he uh, had this basket of rocks, and, and they were unique rocks for sure. Little black smooth stones. And he uh, he passed one out to everybody. He said, take this home and put it on your mantle to remind you, you know, of, of Christ's forgiveness in your life. And and for you to extend that forgiveness to others. 
And I thought, well, that sounds fun. Another decoration for the mail. Uh, you know, I was touched by the story and took the rock home and put it up on my mantel. And so, you know, it was there. That's where it resided. Um, but most of y'all don't know my story. Um, I would venture to say a lot of you don't know my story, so I'll share a piece of it. Um, I was born in Columbus, Georgia. My parents divorced when I was three years old. My father retained parental rights, which, you know, he had primary custody. Uh, my mother moved to Maryland uh, with her second husband at, after that. And uh, my father stayed single till I was 12 and remarried to my current stepmother. We moved to the Birmingham area when I was 15. So geographically, that's me. Um, we were poor growing up. I don't remember ever really wanting for anything. So, I mean, you know, but we, we were poor. Can you imagine being poor? I mean, we, we probably were it. Um, my dad worked three jobs, um, kind of struggled, you know, to make ends meet. We drank powdered milk for a while. And unless you've ever had powdered milk, they still sell it. You could get it. Um, we may be reduced to drinking powdered milk here soon. You never know. Um, my dad would get us up at 5 a.m. I can remember being four years old and having to, like, crawl out of the bed at 5 o'clock in the morning um, and even in kindergarten or whatever to leave for school drop-off. He would drop us off at my aunt's house every morning when he would go start his first job. And uh, we would pray for a 1982 Ford Thunderbird every morning just hoping it would start uh, it smoked so much true story a lady in a donut shop came running out to see if the car was on fire <laughs> it was it's a rough vehicle um but the only thing that i think from my childhood that i say that i feel like i kind of missed growing up would be a mother figure um i always had my aunt rita which is my dad's sister who I love dearly. And uh, she kept us every day while my dad was at work. Um, she was about as close to a mother figure as you could get. Uh, but it wasn't the same, you know, for me anyway, just because my mother still kind of came around um, from time to time. And so that kind of inserted like, hey, something's off here, you know. And I couldn't like just really move past it or move on or whatever. Um, and... Uh, then my dad got remarried when I was 12 to my stepmother. Uh, she already had a daughter two years younger than me, and she instantly became the mother of a 16-year-old teenager, uh, my, my older sister, and the 12-year-old me, uh, which must have been hard. Can you imagine somebody saying, oh, yeah, by the way, here's a kid, you know, <laughs> good luck with your life, As, and that kid being a teenager. Um, I can't even imagine how difficult that, that was an undertaking for her, and there was definitely some pain points and struggle points growing up. Um, that was difficult, but through this time is when I found my salvation. Um, I did have my rebellious years, um, from 17 to 23 ish, maybe, um, probably a little bit younger than that. And I was worse than hopefully some of you will ever be, uh, drinking, partying. Um, I had my, my labre pierced, uh, I had a mohawk. Of course I'd kill for that mohawk now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I would, thought I was living life big. I thought I was living life on the edge. Um, but it took a little while, and finally God, you know, kind of started showing me, hey, you're not literally living life on the edge here. You're just running from adulthood. You're running from being responsible, and most importantly, running from what God was calling into my life. And I uh, didn't realize it, but it was a family. You know, I, I dated Katie, started dating Katie when I was 20, almost 21, and um, dated Katie for five years before we got married. We had our ups and downs, uh, plenty of breakups, and I love yous in between. Uh, it took me five years to realize why I was so afraid of commitment, uh, and it was because of my parents' divorce, which, duh, <laughs> you know, Duh, it was because of my parents' divorce. I, you know, it's funny to think now it took five years to realize because my parents were divorced that I had a struggle with commitment. Um, but man, when you're going through something and, and God's trying to show you something, um, you know, you're blind. You know, you're kind of blind. 
And that's because, you know, you're really supposed to be listening to the voice of God. And and I wasn't doing the things I needed to do to listen, which was the spiritual disciplines. You know, I wasn't seeking God's wisdom, reading scripture like I needed to be reading, praying when I like I need to be praying, uh, fasting like I need to be fasting. I weren't doing I wasn't doing those things. So, you know, of course, I wasn't going to hear what God had for me. But when we got married, I had a very strong belief uh, that divorce was not an option for me. I still have that belief. Um, and I don't think it will be, even to my own demise. Um, Miss Dakota, Jason's wife, uh, she has an Enneagram webpage. She says I'm an Enneagram 6. Uh, you can ask her all about what that means. It means I'm a loyalist. Um, so maybe that's part of it. I don't know. But um, after we started having children, uh, I think there was like a tor turning point in my life. Uh, I, you know, I, I'd gone back to being a faithful Christian and, you know, living the life like I was supposed to live after we got married. And, and uh, with my mother coming kind of back into the picture a little bit, she wanted to be in the wedding and kind of help with all that type of thing and kind of inject into my life again, I had kind of started to develop a little bit of resentment. And I guess I didn't realize it, of course, at the time. I was blind going through it. And um, I developed these resentful thoughts and kind of grudges going through this, kind of lied to myself about it. But uh, and then when we started having kids that resentment began to grow uh, pretty significantly, actually. Um, it was when my son turned three, and it kind of hit me, you know, like one day I woke up and I was looking at this kid running around playing just as happy as he could be. Uh, my son is just one of the coolest, coolest guys, you know, that to me walks the face of the planet. He's just so mild tempered and nothing really riles him up and he's just a good kid and when he was three years old I was sitting there staring at him and I was just like how how could a parent leave this behind how could my mother look at a three-year-old and go nah not for me I'm out you know I of course that was a very selfish thought because you know I don't know what the marriage was like or what was going on behind the scenes of course but that was the kind of thoughts I was having and that resentment, you know, like, how could you just say I'm good with twice a year visits? I'll just send you a gift on Christmas. I really couldn't get my head around that, especially having a three-year-old of my own who I would do anything for. Um, my mother would still come around. Um, She's a great grandparent. I will never take that away from her. Uh, me and Katie had talked at the beginning of our marriage that, you know, I didn't want to take that away from my children, the opportunity to have a, a grandparent relationship, no matter what was going on between me and my mother. So that kept that there for sure. Um, <clears throat> but one time she came to visit from Colorado and she was staying at our house for a little while. And... <laughs> The resentment was pretty strong at this point, and uh, I would do everything in my power to not be in the same room with her. I'd go feverishly clean the kitchen if she was sitting in the living room. I'd be washing all the dishes and mopping, wiping the refrigerator down, and I would just find anything I could do to clean and kind of stay out of that room. And then she'd come in the kitchen, I'd run to the living room and start straightening the couch and vacuuming and whatever, you know. Of course, if my wife is watching this, she probably wishes that my mother would come around more often because of that. Um, but one night she was here and my, Katie was putting the kids to bed and it was just me and my mother sitting in the living room and, um, it was silent. TV wasn't on, nothing. We were just sitting there staring at each other. It was weird. And, um, something happened that I, I could have never dreamed of happening. She, um, she just began to cry. She began to cry and just like like that hard boohoo cry. And I didn't know what to do. I was just, you know, taken back by what was happening, you know, uh, seeing an emotion that I've never really seen before from her. And um, 
She began to beg for my forgiveness. And I mean like beg, like grovel. Um, apologizing profusely for the things that she's done and things she hasn't done. And man, that resentment, that little nest egg of resentment down inside just began to build. And every thought that I could have in that moment, um, everything that I've ever wanted to say, everything that I resented her for came to the forefront of my mind. And, I mean, it was so much you could just, you could taste it. I could taste the resentment. It was so close to coming out of my mouth. And I held all the power in that moment. I held all the power of a future relationship with my mother. I held all the power for her, you know, her own self-reflection of the type of person she is. Um, I, it was it was a very weird experience, um, and I and to be honest with you, I, at the in the moment, I, I really wanted you know to cut her down, uh, cut her legs out from under her just as quick as she stood up and could even offer to give that up, uh, asking for forgiveness. I wanted to just slice her down, and um, but man, sitting there. All those awful things on the edge of my tongue. And I open my eyes and I see a little smooth black rock on my mantle. And I immediately flash back to the story that Larry had told about forgiveness. How we can't throw the first stone. And I began to imagine all the things that I've done in my life that Christ knows intimately. And said, you know what? I'm going to climb up on that cross anyway for you. Just to have a relationship with me. Just to bridge that gap between me and God. Do you ever think about it in that way? Um, you always hear about people saying, you know, Christ died for everyone's sins. and He died for our sins. He died for your sins. He died for your sins. The way you've held grudges against your friends, the drinking, the sex, the fill-in-the-blank self-fulfillment sin of your choice, he died for you anyway. Knowing that, in that moment, all that's going through my head, I couldn't, I couldn't let my grieving mother hear the things that was wanted to come out. Who am I to who am I not to forgive because of what Christ has done for me? So I got up, I picked up the rock, and I handed it to her. I let her know that because Jesus saved me and the grace he extended into my life, I can't throw a stone. I let her take the rock as a memory, and in that moment I forgave her. Gave her for, for everything. Um, I mean, you know, of course you want you would want to hear at this point that we have a wonderful relationship and everything's all hunky-dory at this point, but forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Um, I haven't forgotten the things about my past. After all, there's a, here's a testimony that I'm able to give uh, from what Christ did in my life through this situation. The past I've had has made me who I am today. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is James 1, 2, and I'll read 2 through 5. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. See, we use the items of our past to build bridges for relationships. You know, my, re my relationship with my mother isn't perfect, uh, but we've, we've begun a new one uh, on a new footing, understanding where we were. And to be honest, what a perfect reflection of our lives with Christ. 
understanding where where we were before Christ entered our lives is just magnifies the reality of what Christ has done for us. The reality of him taking your sins and climbing up on that cross and loving you anyway, no matter where you are in your life. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Do you have anyone you need to forgive? Maybe a parent, maybe a friend. Um, do you need to seek forgiveness with God? John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Go to God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time, Lord, and uh, hearing more about your word, God. Uh, thank you for us being able to come together as a group, Lord. Um, this is such an interesting time in our world right now that, you know, we as Christians are actually being able to abandon the building, going and being Christ in our communities and our families, Lord, and um, learning about your word together from afar. And God, this is amazing that, you know, this many people can sit and uh, dive into your word, Lord, and learn more about you. Lord, I pray that uh, those who hear my testimony, God, only hear you, that they can see a reflection of Jesus Christ, Lord, through my life. And I pray for each and every one of these youth, God, that they become a beacon of light in this community, Lord, that people can look at them and say, God is merciful, and God is forgiving. And Lord, I pray for any of those that are asking for forgiveness, God, you meet them where they are. And Lord, for those who don't have salvation, Lord, and trust in you and follow you, God, I pray that you soften their hearts, Lord, to know that they can seek after you for anything and everything, Lord. Pray for these next few weeks, Lord, in this tough time that we're going through, Lord, and we pray for this community, that God, that you keep us healthy and safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, Super Wednesday, Batman, you're welcome. Y'all have a good one.